Okay, now we're gonna be good. We're recording. Yeah, should we give it a, a few more minutes, Jim, real quick here? We'll just, yeah, we'll give it another minute or so. So um, give me time to ask Andy. So speaking of family affairs, my wife and I, last night, we finished uh, the last season of Succession. Okay. Oh, 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 wow. Has anyone, everyone seen that show? Oh, loved it. Yeah, unbelievable. Okay. Jim, yes. when are we, when are we gonna, those partners that have agreed to your three-year term, when do we get it? Four to five. We're, we're gonna cover that here momentarily, okay. Andy. I'm expressing um, anxious enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a kid on Christmas Eve, huh? No, you can't go in your parents' closet, Andy. <laughs> but I came out of my parents' closet. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh. All right. Jim, we're three after. Should we get, get kick it off? Yeah, let's kick, let's kick things off. All right, so I'll just put this up here real quick, and we'll go, kind of go in order. Uh, just kind of, uh, you know, where we're headed today. Um, Jim's got a quick announcement. Then um, we, um, I think Michelle will skip marketing today, right? We'll come back next week to that. Um, we'll have Leron do a kind of a, a, a quick abridged version of what we went through last week. And we'll go to a, an open Q&A for those that may have still had questions. And then I got an open topic here I want to ask people about, which is managing browsers. This is um, an area that, you know, I'm not, you know, we're, we're not here going to quote unquote educate. We'll certainly pose, you know, where we see the industry and what uh, organizations like Gartner are seeing. Um, but we, this is more of a conversational topic with you all versus a directional who we're going to tell you or educate you. Um, we'll set the stage and then open it up for debate. So with that, Jim, let me uh, open it up to you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Andrew. And welcome, everybody. It's great to see all of you loyal Sassy Call followers uh, back for this week. Uh, so, yeah, just real quick, wanted to make an announcement around a recent hire that we made here at SAS Source for those that haven't seen it on LinkedIn or any of our social channels. So. Uh, for those that know Ben Jones, uh, formerly of CTS, uh, he's been a partner at SAS Search now for well over a year. Uh, he won uh, one of our core cool rules challenges around Respond. Uh, he's been an avid supporter from the very beginning. And uh, we this past week, Monday was his first day at SAS Search. Um, so <clears throat> we don't make a habit just so Owners of MSPs out there know we don't make it a habit of uh, you know bringing on uh, employees of our partners, um, but you know Ben expressed you know a lot of interest. We had posted a position by the way for a uh, sales engineer, and um, Ben was looking around, but he he was so enthusiastic about what we were doing at SAS Source that he inquired, and we were able to work it out uh, with with CTS. And uh, it just, it worked out very well. And we're, we're beyond excited to have Ben on board. Uh, I think it's a testament to, you know, how he feels about the product and, and ultimately also, you know, what we're able to deliver to the community that he, he was so anxious to, to join Sassler. So I wanted to officially let everyone here know uh, that Ben is now part of Sassler and, and formally welcome Ben on this call. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jim. Do we have Thank a speech? You. Is there a speech prepared for the, you know, the academy here, Ben? <laughs> no, no speech, no speech. <laughs> well, I can tell you this, Andrew. Like, you know, I have uh, one-on-ones with several employees throughout the SAS Search organization weekly, and one of them uh, already told me, you know, Ben is crushing it in, in week one based on some of the things he's been sharing. So, um, already paying dividends. And you know what? It's a it's really, you know, our, our community here, our MSPs, they know so much, you know, not every MSP. It's funny, Gary Peek and I were talking about this this morning. 
not every MSP qualifies, I think, as a good MSP or have you know great employees. But I think our you know our SASE community is chock full of awesome people, awesome companies. And I feel really fortunate, you know, to have this group every week. Agree, Jim. It's but it's it's a fantastic community. It's uh you know, very quickly. Last week was I was I was really blown away that you guys had close to how many was it? Two hundred one eighty seven we topped out. I mean, that's that's a staggering number of yeah. people. Mm -hmm. We gotta have more more product announcements, even if they're not real. Let's just do it. <laughs> well, the next big one is gonna be in December. So we, okay. we'll we'll get up over two hundred and uh we'll, we'll have enough room for everybody at that one. <laughs> Fair so I, I, I want everyone on the call to take note that Andrew just recommended to us that we adopt the Microsoft Vaporware approach to, to product <laughs> uh, development. Anything, look, you know, anything can be a feature, right, Chip? I suppose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Microsoft's done a hell of a job at it, right? Yeah. Um, all right. Do we have Leron with us? We do. Awesome. So, Leron, could we do a kind of an abridged version, maybe the high level fortify overview and open it up to see if there's any outstanding Q&A? Well, before we let Leron go, uh, Andy yeah. asked a very pointed question about okay. the, the beta and everything. So I'm going to actually let Chip handle that one before we turn over to Leron. Sure. So, Andy, your inquiring mind wants to know. Um, so partners who registered for the beta um, should start seeing SouthWorks Fortify as a, um, a menu option in their production instance today, um, if, if they haven't already. Um, we're going to continue um, to run the beta for the next several days over the weekend, take a little more feedback into early next week. Um, we're not asking more partners to join the beta. In fact, we're going to keep it at the number that we have now. Um, and then we expect to go into GA um, on time next week. Our target date is the 15th. And I think we'll be ready to push Fortify out for everyone uh, early next week. Awesome. And we're, we're going to be turning that on for folks starting after this meeting. I wanted to let Jim and Chip make the announcement and then we'll start flipping people on. And then we'll send out an email to those folks that have uh, previously signed up with their account managers or in other means. May All I right. say, I actually see the menu item now on my SASLERX console that I've logged in. So thank you. But you can't access it, right? I haven't tried yet. I'm about to. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to jump in here. I'll do my best to keep everybody. Uh, Engaged, awake, and excited. <laughs> Jim, why are you laughing? I don't understand. I don't know. It just struck me. Oh, okay. So this is the report. And just so you guys know, the report is not yet in the production environment. So you're not going to see um, this. We should have this coming over the next day or two. But last week, I showed a tenant that had a free Azure AD license. I also mentioned last week that roughly 50% of our Microsoft connections are free Azure AD licenses. So I wanted to show something a little bit different this week, whereas this tenant is has a very healthy license level, including P2, and this important one, which is Microsoft Defender for Office 365 P1. All right, so last week, We've called this, just because we can't just repeat this over and over again, we're calling this MDOP1, right? So MDOP1 gives you roughly 30 to 40 percentage points first based on a few Microsoft tenants that we've analyzed. And this one happens to have it on. So as you can see, the current secure score on this one is nearly 78% but the potential on it is basically 99%, right? So as far as I'm concerned, if we're purely talking cybersecurity licensing and we're debating, should we get the E5 or not? I just don't think it's worth it for a point less than a percentage point from a security standpoint. 
we don't need an E5. There's plenty of opportunity for us to improve our score at the current license level over here. Something I think is worth mentioning from last week is we're aggregating the benchmark data. We didn't want to, if we showed benchmark data, like on day one, the sample size is so small that the numbers are, it's just going to be chaos. So with version 1.1 of the product that will also include templates, which is the most requested feature, um, we'll include and release the benchmark data for you. Down here in the report, we have those recommended actions that you can implement for the given tenant, plus those recommended actions are already in place. We built this in such a way that coming out of the gate, we're using the Microsoft framework. We've had partners, what about this framework, this framework, or that framework, ask us? And the answer is, we totally plan to do that. In fact, down here, we have a recommendation that came during the development cycle. And we thought it was such a good rep recommendation that we wanted to go through the exercise of actually implementing it, right? And this is the CISA recommendation to disable automatic forwarding to external domains. So here's a, how this would play out in the future. CISA or any other governing framework would come out and they'd say, hey, we think this policy makes a lot of sense. This would be brought up to us either via our account managers, our executives. We pay attention to these things on our own. The, the sassy call, right? One of these policies would come up. Everyone thinks it's a wonderful idea. We'll go ahead and get that implemented. An email will go out and say, hey, we have this new policy. And let's say, for example, this is the new policy. And you agree that, oh, yeah, this is a no brainer. I want to deploy this for everyone. Right? The way that that would work out is you would then go into Fortify. And this is my Fortify tenant in the dev environment. I'm only connected to a single tenant here. So you could take this, right? If, imagine you had 100 tenants connected and this policy had just come out. So you could do this 100 times. I would just search for CISA, select all, go next. And then if I were to apply, these, apply this action, it's going to go ahead and flip this to off across 100 different Microsoft tenants in a matter of minutes, right? During during the call last week, I'd asked Chip how long this would take him to do across 100 different tenants. I don't know what the answer was, but it's a long time. Logging in and switching between 100 different tenants, going to this screen and flipping this switch to off, we're talking about a huge amount of hours that are being saved. The right, One of the important lessons that we've learned from these types of calls is the ability to go back and undo something if if it was done by mistake or whatever the case might be. So let's say, for instance, I want to undo this event. I can select multiples and I can say undo, and then I can undo these actions. This will go ahead and restore them to their previous state. And another thing that we've learned while doing demos of the product is the fact that you may not want to do things the Microsoft way, or you may have, for instance, a customer whose owner is a global admin who thinks that multi-factor authentication is the worst idea in the world. And you've had them sign a piece of paper that basically says, if you get hacked, that's on you. And you want to go ahead and get rid of this, right? So you could go ahead and click dismiss and you could select risk accepted, or maybe you have another product in place to handle this, in which case you can say, we have alternative mitigation in place. This is a new feature that this box wasn't here last week. And the reason that we've added this is because if given the MFA situation that I just talked about in the example, right, whoever the tech is that's doing this, you could say the customer has signed off on our form and acknowledge that they are willing to live with the risk and then say risk accepted. 
And then last thing I think I'll show is we also have the event history. So you can see what am I, what are we looking at? Require MFA for all admin users. We have a description here that spells out what it is is taking place. And then it also says implementation status. You have one of two users with admin roles that aren't registered and protected with MFA. So you can get a little bit more detail and then you can see, okay, it looks like Jason planned to do this. And then he performed the action and then Fortify applied the action. So I'm going to stop here and see if we have any questions. Lidron, can you um, highlight what the tool tips look like that, that explain um, what each recommendation does? We've had a question about that. Sure. So here's a good one. And we've designed these tool tips so we can change them very, very quickly. So because we know that we're going to have questions, we're going to need clarification on these. So we plan to listen to you guys and adjust these as needed in order to make sure that you have the information that you need on these. I see Andy has a question. I do, and that is all around the prospecting model that uh, SAS Alerts has talked about from the beginning. This could pretty quickly move through, uh, this, if you are, have a Fortify license, and I, I said, hey, look, these are all the things that are not set, and I could talk about all these, uh, all these challenges that uh, an organization might be facing. Um, having a method of communicating this information succinctly and without having to generate all this manually would be really helpful. Is that something report-wise or a, a, a document that could say, oh my goodness, you know, a red alert, you don't have MFA enabled, for example, or, you know, that your, your score is 50 out of 100. And by the way, this is part of an ana uh, analysis that we do when we do um, when we first deploy SAS alerts for either prospective or registered customers. So that's exactly what this report is intended to do, Andy. It's intended to be a five minute report. So in this particular case, the conversation with the customer would be, you're at 78% at your current P2 Microsoft Defender for Office P1 potential is let's round up and call it 99%. I think you have the right licensing, right? So we have roughly 20 percentage points, an opportunity to increase your score, but 20%. But the free Azure AD conversation, I think is the most, is the more interesting one to have where the score potential is gonna be somewhere in the 50% range. And instead of showing you the next license up as an E5, like I have here, the next license up that you're going to see is Microsoft Defender for Office P1 with an additional 30 to 40 percentage points. And then you can have, right, put the computer away and then talk to them about why it is a good idea to strongly consider upgrading to a new license in order to increase the security posture potential. And down here is the list of things that can be done in order to increase the security. And if you wanted to, you could print this report or share this report with your prospect or customer. Am I able then to have mitigations included in this initial report that might be, hey, you know, they're using uh, Duo for multi-factor authentication and we can add that in as a, a way to have that part of this report. Or if they were using, let's say a, a secure email gateway solution, or they were using a, a, a SOC that uses, let's say Huntress or Silence or something else, how we could get that where this isn't necessarily visible to them, vis visible to SAS alerts. So yes, there's another report that is intended to be the report where you show them what you've done for them as far as increasing the Microsoft tenant security posture and the security configuration. So it'll spell out what policies and recommended actions you've applied. And if you recall, when I went here 
and I dismissed an action, yep. I can say that I have alternative mitigation in place, right? So alternative mitigation and risk accepted are going to affect your score differently, right? When you say risk accepted, you're not going to get points for that. But when you say alternative mitigation is in place, you are going to get the points for that because we're basically, we and Microsoft are going to trust you and say, you're handling this somewhere else. Right. And all of that is going to appear on a report that we plan to start working as soon as this becomes generally available. Last question, Liron. How long does it take Fortify to populate this information once we have access to the Microsoft team? <laughs> that is a good question. I'm guessing that Jason is not here. I mean, I might be able to help answer that, Liron, um, having done a number of test connections myself. Um, Andy, it, it's typically under five minutes. I mean, I, I just went through testing this morning on the new prod instance um, with a you know an existing 365 tenant that we use for quite a bit of testing. Um, and my process was to first join the organization, um, then connect respond and then connect fortify. Um, but, you know, by the time I got back around, um, to checking in critical alerts to make sure that all of those events showed up, that I added the SAS integrations um, and went back to Fortify. The, the, the data from Microsoft and the recommendations were already there. Cool. One, then the follow-up to that would be, if I add Defender licensing as an example that they didn't have, they said, fix this right now. How long would that take to reflect? Once Probably license... 24 hours. Okay. So one thing we have noticed is that um, you'll see changes um, relatively quickly. When you apply one of the recommendations, you'll see those changes quite quickly um, in terms of what the recommendations are, are left and available in the UI. But the actual changes to modify the secure score itself um, won't be re recalculated by Microsoft for another 24 hours. So the secure score as a number is a lagging indicator to what you've done to accept recommendations and secure the tenant. So Andy, to answer your question, I think it would, once you've connected the, let's say you upgrade to Microsoft Defender right now, I would expect to see that within 24 hours. And for those, due to that right recalculation lag, when you apply a policy, we move it to ongoing like this one. The Fortify Anti-Phishing Global Policy. Right, so this is, a, this is a big one because we basically combined eight or nine different policies um, together because there were too many dependencies between them. So you can just kind of get an easy 25 points if, if you apply this. Uh, but it is going <clears> to <throat> remain an ongoing until we hear back from Microsoft that Microsoft has basically acknowledged that, yes, you have this. I'm going to give you that those 25 points. And then it will be completed. Um, Chip, can I ask you a question? Sure. Are there, is, is there any thoughts on putting, like, business impact like a skill, like as a like kind of like a free form or, or ability for partners to add information for example if someone has a really poor anti-phishing policy and, and mfa lack of mfa you know could we have some type of calculation of risk of business email compromise so that we i understand all the technical side of this because it's you know technical scoring but if we're going to also try to get a business action or outcome from a, a an end customer, my rhetorical question, I'm not saying I have the answer or that you should do this, but how do we speak in the language of the business and get out of the tech techno babble so that we can get them to do something? Um, well, I think the answer to that is that, you know, primarily, as a community, we're depending upon the MSPs to know their customer and know how to approach that on an individual basis, right? It's a very different conversation 
you know, with a law office than it is with an engineering firm. Like you, 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 you couch the, uh, the concepts differently depending upon the audience. Um, I mean, I think you're right. Like you could, we would all universally agree that if your customer refuses to have any sort of multi-factor authentication, their risk of compromise is considerably higher. Um, how we could quantify that um, precisely just on that one event is pretty difficult to do. I think, I think we are right now relying on Microsoft's determination of that, of that increased risk and following uh, the, the, the score percentage, if you will, that they're putting out there. Just an idea, and again, we can certainly take this offline, but just an idea I have, correct, like the law firm is different from the architectural firm than different from the engineering firm, I get it, but we're all talking about risk to revenue, risk to reputation. If I could get like, um, you know, the folks from CIS on a call, Chip, with you and the team, and we could maybe look at correlating to, because the the controls are now mapped to DVI, you know, VZD, uh, Verizon. Um, where we could use maybe a percentage calc, um, just an idea where there could be a simple risk to revenue based on VZDBIR calc stats. And then, you know, there's something that is a little bit more intriguing at from a business owner perspective. Yeah, it's an interesting notion. I think we'll 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 probably need to take it offline and sort of flesh out how that fits into Sazzler's mission or where it fits in. Um, but it, it's an interesting notion. Okay. I, ha I have a follow-up question about as you drill down and build out more um, requirements or policies as security evolves, can we get an alerting mechanism from Fortify that says, hey, look, this just crossed a threshold or that there's been, uh, this customer is uh, now fallen below what is acceptable. Um, and we could then begin this process of knowing to reach out to them, or do we have to look at this? Um, in other words, I'm asking for exception management around security scores and as they change from day to day. Liron, you want to take that or you want me to? No, I mean, we could, we could certainly build that. Um, we also have, we tell you when things regress, right? So in this case, these two events have both regressed. So we could do that, but the notion of creating like a threshold and to say, we want all of our customers to be at 70% or more. And if anybody falls under that, we could potentially notify you. I'm thinking that there's a value proposition because you're going to, CIS is going to add something. You're going to add something. It might be we've mitigated something or they change their risk behavior. We, or we might want to say, you know, we want to identify all the customers that are below an 80 and say, we have, we, unless you change your profile, we have to say goodbye, right? Because we can't afford to work with you as a risk profile, as an example. I mean, there's that, that kind of alerting mechanism, I think will become valuable, especially if there are threats discovered that could be solved by a security setting, for example. Yeah. So in the last week, we talked about the concept of drift, which is very closely aligned to what, what you're talking about here. Um, Sazzlerts will include an alert in the manage section, um, a configurable alert in terms of its severity. That's going to be up to you guys to configure. We'll have a default for it, of course. It will tell you when there's been a regression on any item, um, which results in a reduction of the secure score. So in other words, if you set this up in a co-managed tenant and your I hate it when you get frozen. <laughs> I just do. I don't know. What's that? You froze. Yeah. You're okay now, I think. But okay. So, Andy, real quickly, there there is an alert that comes um, in the manager section when a change is made to a tenant and it impacts the score. That regression that Lee Run talks about. So that will show up. Um, I I I I, I want to kind of take that on the committee with really this group, whether or not we should go beyond that um, and start generating events and alerts um, based upon just overall secure score percentages. I mean, one of the things that we're all struggling with is how to keep SAS alerts less noisy. Um, so, you know, we wanna be mindful that we're not cramming in too much information. So Chip, isn't this a policy enforcement mechanism and that if somebody falls out of policy compliance because of an addition or a modification, 
shouldn't we all be made uh, made aware of that? Because I yeah, see this and you will be. I see this reducing noise. To be honest with you. Yeah, you, but you will be. You will be already uh, provided an alert when someone makes a change that modifies settings that you've made through Fortify. Um, and we've had a suggestion from other partners that I've talked to in the past week, which we're going to implement, which will be a drift report, um, which will, you know, you can schedule it to send to yourself monthly or weekly and show you which of your customers have drifted um, in terms of configuration management from one state to the next. There are some great suggestions coming up in chat too about financial risks and exposing that. But this is uh, Henry, thanks for letting me speak. Yeah, someone's asking from level five management, are we thinking of SaaS alerts as a risk management platform moving forward? And I don't necessarily think, I mean, inherently, I think a good cybersecurity platform does reduce risk. Yeah, right. I so just that, responded to that, Jim. In, yeah. in writing. We've always thought of SaaS alerts as a risk management platform right? from day one. Okay. Other things that we want to, let's see. Anything else, Chip, that we should address here? No, I think we're pretty well covered for now, Andy. Okay. Jim, anything in closing? Uh, no, just, you know, obviously we're excited to get this in the hands of all of our existing partners. Um, you know, it's funny, there, there's been a lot of buzz uh, that has been kind of generated that we've been receiving um, uh, ever since last Thursday when we launched on, on this call and to the point where we now have nearly 200 people signed up for Tuesday's call where we're launching it to, to prospects as well. Um, so it's, uh, we're just excited and we're excited for what it can do for all of, all of you. Awesome. Jeez, uh, so Dave, at the end there, Chip put in GCC high. Uh, yeah, any... responding to him now. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess I have a question though, Andrew. Yeah. For, you know, our loyal folks on this call, like we know that there are a lot of partners that are using us, but they're using us, I would say, selectively. Uh, they don't put us on every customer at this point. So I guess my question is with for, fortified now in the mix, the more partners anticipate leveraging this across every customer that they have, or will they continue to, to just kind of pick and choose? I'd love to get some answers back on that, especially for those that have chosen to pick and choose. Jim, I apologize. Literally, as you started talking, a guy with a blower literally was right outside my window and I couldn't hear a word you said. So I apologize. So I muted. Um, yeah. So I was just asking the question and, and Dave's coming in saying we're rolling it out to all customers over time. Um, I was going, what I was saying is that, you know, since we started, we've had partners kind of pick and choose on who they put SaaS certs on. And now with Fortify released into the platform, do people anticipate now covering everybody? You know, it's in their yeah, it's great. And it's a great question, Jim. It's almost like, you know, just fortify almost, lead, you know, become your leader, right? Because of the configurations and settings and management of it. So right. it's a great, what, can, can you guys throw into chat, Jim's, your thoughts? Dave obviously did over time. It's really paying off. Dave, Dave Stutzman, can you, can you uh, just clarify? I mean, it's great. Like, what way is it paying off for you? Is there any chance? Are you on? Do you have a mic? Sorry about that. No, no slot. Um, the reporting that we're using to get customers to understand what's really going on with their account, uh, we found Sasslers to be invaluable to get them to understand before it was more of a please do this because you need to. And now it is here's proof of what's going on and the risks that you're seeing. 
Is there anything in particular in the report, like one area that seems to be resonating more than others? Uh, one example, I click all events on the uh, cyber report and show them the graphic picture of the world, whether they're green or red or yellow. They look at that and say, oh my gosh. So that that is much of a portrayal as anybody when you're speaking to executives is the pretty graphs. Yeah, exactly. We, we always call that the oh shit report. Internal. Exactly. Fantastic. It's almost like a heat map report. Yeah. Yeah. When you scroll down and show the attacks on the accounts item by item and the maximum quantity, especially if that hits one of the leaders in the company like it usually does. Right. Uh, that just shows really well. Um, Dave, Dave Ketter, I hope I'm not butchering your last name. Can, can you share like why this for you in your words like why is it accelerating the process for you why do you feel it will well i mean just because of the fact that we can mass update settings based on secure score that's going to be that's the reason why i was going to accelerate it the the rollout would, because of would that it, would it be an easier would you quote unquote charge or would you just bake it in like a, um, we're going to plan on the baking it in, at least for our managed clients, we're going to bake it in. Okay. Clients that aren't fully managed, we're going to charge them. Okay. And, and, and is the baking in, you're sitting there going, look, based on just labor alone, I'm going to benefit from I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, sir. Just trying to get, again, your thought process, like, shit, if I got to configure all this back and forth and have my ad, you know, net admins check it. It's just, I'm going to save money. Net, I'm going to save money if I'm doing this. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's part of it. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So I would encourage you, Dave and, and others. Thank you for speaking up, by the way. This is an opportunity for MSPs to have your cake and eat it too. And every MSP that I talk to, I recommend this, is that this is an opportunity. Like we now have seen, and it's, it's, it's been proven out time and time and time again. For MSPs that are on SaaS service that are using us that have gone out and leveraged our coverage extension notification. If you haven't, if you don't have it, talk to your account manager. We have it in their channel program portal where you can access it and deploy it. But you know, on average, our MSPs are charging an incremental $3 per user per month. That was before Fortify. Like now Fortify has just become the absolute no brainer on top of it. But the opt-out rate is only three to 5% when you push this out to every single customer in your base. And I think it's because we haven't given customers enough credit. They're always gonna push back in price, right? And increasing costs. But inherently, they understand if you're if you're pitching it right. They're, I shouldn't say pitching. If you're educating properly, right, they understand that 365 is literally at the heart of what they do every single day. It's the cornerstone application. If it's not 365, it's going to be Google Workspace, and it's tied to everything. So when you explain to them that the the landscape has changed and this has become hardening of 365. You know, making sure that we baseline configurations, improving configurations, monitoring drift, and then being able to monitor user behavior on an ongoing basis and respond to it in real time. They understand that. And they're not saying no. So I'm saying, when I say this is your opportunity to have your cake and eat it too, this is literally your time to be able to get more money and save labor all at the same time. And that's what I want to see for every single one of you. I want all of you to make a lot more money and increase your margins. Good stuff, Jim. I mean, it's almost like becoming the tail wagging the dog here, as I see it. Yeah, I mean, I don't want, I don't, you know, I don't want to get my soapbox or anything, but I do. Obviously, I feel passionate and strongly about this, only because I was a former MSP. So. For a long time, and I, you know, I, I sat where where all of you have sat before, and I know how hard it is. This business is hard; it's a grind. So when you have an opportunity to actually make more money 
and make life easier on yourself, by all means, take it. I mean, there are, there are companies out there that go direct to your customers that are charging $7 per user per month for functionality like this. Like you should easily be able to get three, four, five dollars. Or, you know, we've got, you know, Frank on this call right now. He gets ten dollars per user per month for SAS alerts. You know, and in, in the Midwest, there's Frank right there. Frank's from Nebraska. Like, so when people say, oh, in my market, I can't get that. You know, I, I'm, I'm in a, a tier three or tier four market. I'm not in New York City or DC or San Francisco. I can't command those types of prices. If it's positioned the right way and you're educating your customers and prospects the right way, you can absolutely get it. Great stuff, Jim. I, I agree. Uh, and if Gary Pika was on right now, as fired up as I am, he'd be 10 times more fired up. You know that, Andrew. I do know that. <laughs> I want to call him and see if we can get him. And then, you know, <laughs> you know one of these days, let's get him acting. We should get him as a guest one of these days. I can't believe we haven't come up with that idea already. That's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay to switch topics for a bit, Jim? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Um, so, again, folks, I would just really, Think about this as we'd love your, at the end of the day, just want your thoughts. Don't, uh, I want to be, I want to iterate as I share my screen. This is not like, you should do this. I, I'm genuinely curious based on what I'm reading. And I, because more and more articles are coming out. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yeah, gotcha, yeah. Andrew. Perfect. So, so I'm reading more and more articles. We're going back and forth, you know, in text with Jim and Chip about this. But you're starting to see the notion that, you know, why aren't service providers managing the browser, right? And I know there's some platforms out there coming into our space or in our space um, looking at, you know, multi-tenanted management of the browser. Um, obviously, you know, we have to deal with all sorts of noise like plugins and security issues. And if we think about it, right, I mean, really the browser, or as Phyllis Lee likes to say from CIS, the new, right, the no longer, you know, we defend at the fingertips. Does that resonate, by the way, with everybody? So the browser is really you know, become the work foundation, if you will, you know, the really the core premise of where people work. Um, so let me just say that, you know, Gartner sees this as a, you know, and Gartner obviously plays up market, but they are seeing this as a, you know, massive um, opportunity for service providers. Um, looking at obviously, you know, web security, you know, certainly, you know, if you're managing devices that are on and off the network, et cetera. So anybody want to just chime in? Like, do you, could you see yourself going, wow, that, that, you know, once there are tools or good tools for this, this is something, or are you doing it today in some way? So um, I, I would just love, love people's perspective on this. And, and by the way, as you guys maybe raise your hands and we could pick somebody or somebody chime in. Chip, did I frame that out right? And, and anything you'd want to add from a you know, CTO founder perspective? Yeah, I, I think so. I think you framed it well. And um, you know, with, this goes hand in hand with the, with the fact that SaaS as a methodology of accessing business applications is, has really become the dominant trend um so the browser then it becomes essentially the endpoint the computer um, right because you can do anything with a chromebook that you can do you know in the SaaS universe with a, a macbook or a windows laptop or uh you know even a linux device so 
there are a lot of dangerous settings um, in, in browsers. The, th the one that drives me the most crazy is how browsers automatically save passwords. And very few people shut off that functionality. They just let it happen. Yeah. Uh, but there's, there's obviously <laughs> other dangers. There's cookies. There's, um, you know, there's, there's PII that's stored in browsers. They want to save your credit cards. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff that's dangerous. Well, I, I just, I love that one because you get Ryan Weeks going on, you know, like one time he saw my browser pop up to save a password. He's like, what the hell? Like, you know, because obviously info stealers love that. Yep. That's, that's exactly what they prey on or one of the big things they prey on. So um, anyway. Um, but I see Adam chimed in uh, yeah. after looking at a product called Conceal, um, you know, specifically for this. I mean, Adam, if you'd like to yeah, share you, with us, uh, with everyone, what, what your research is there and what's driving you toward that product that we'd be interested in hearing it. Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's a relatively new product, uh, I think, to the market, particularly in the UK. Um, the, I mean, the basis is that any website that you visit gets checked against um, a reputational database, which they use multiple databases, and you can plug in extra, of, of a, of a, um other references like uh, Cisco Umbrella or Virus Total, or, you know, other platforms like that. Um, but it also uh, it loads the um, the website into a sandbox environment before it actually brings it up in the browser. If it's if it's a site that hasn't been referenced before, so you can actually see in the sandbox environment what what the website looks like and what it does before you know before it's it's um, populated in the user's browser. So it's, it's so it's quite a novel approach compared to other uh, sort of browse security products I've looked at in the past. Very cool. Have you have you deployed it at all? Uh, only in house testing so far. Um, only been looking at it for for a few days. So uh, early stages yet. Yeah. So have you gotten? Have you personally gotten yourself in trouble, Adam? <laughs> only <laughs> uh, only once or twice, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, Chad, would you, be, I'm working my way up, but Chad, any thoughts you could jump on with us and give us your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I almost exclusively use Google Workspace. So management through the browser can be done through admin console. Um, but talking about like conceal that adds um, RBI can certainly be useful for uh, like getting to sites that are fake login pages and stuff. That's really what it's for. Um, but in terms of, of using SAS alerts to do it, I don't know if the best way to manage local Chrome is to use a SAS product like that or to have an agent of some kind on the device that can persist settings. Um, Cause there are ways to kind of get to work around um, what's going on with those push policies. Yeah, just to clarify, Chad, this bringing this discussion up wasn't necessarily a, hey, should we add this to SAS alerts? But we do think this is a tangential security element that's important to the community, uh, to what our mission is. And our mission is really looking at the behavior of SAS accounts. Um, you know, whether or not that extends down into their specific behavior on a browser, you now you're in a fuzzy line, right? Because a browser is sort of a virtual thing and is as of itself almost a SaaS application. It's the meta SaaS application. But you're right. We we're not. We have never been interested in driving down into direct device management with an agent or that sort of thing. And you can sorry, but you can enforce uh, like endpoint management policies and restrictions. So like. You can push uh, a plugin that or an add-on in Chrome that will check for browser state and and device state to um, restrict login to someone's Google account to begin with. So you can't even leverage um, those kind of things to begin with. You can't sign into the browser. You can't do anything until you uh, meet those requirements. So there are some things that are kind of in place, but RBI has been interesting to me. But I feel like the cost per endpoint and where that fits in with other tools that already exists it starts to be an interesting ROI uh, issue because a lot of them seem pretty expensive for what they do. 
Um, I know there's a lot of resources to keep spinning up containers for RBI is really what it's doing. It's opening everything in a sandbox that it's not sure about. Um, but the cost thing, when you're already talking about three to five to eight dollars per endpoint for like an RBI solution, um, it starts to get a little gray as to where you're going to actually make your money back on that for the small uh, function that it has when you can set other policies and settings. Chad, just curious, you've mentioned, you know, how you're using Chrome for managing this. I'm, I'm assuming, though, that's not, it's it's on a one-by-one -one basis. Like, in other words, Chrome doesn't have, here's your multi-tenanted platform to manage all your customers. Chrome doesn't have multi-tenanted unless you are a uh, gigantic reseller where you get access to a multi-tenanted approach. But you're talking... Uh, north of half a million dollars in sales a year, plus other requirements to to meet that. So I don't meet that. So I don't have multi-tenanted. So, um, but you don't have to have a licensed account for each tenant. You can use a cloud identity license and give it super admin credentials. So you don't actually have to pay any money um, to get access to people's tenants. But I just have my clients um, purchase through Google directly, typically, and then I'll just plug myself in and then lock down their accounts with hardware keys. So they'll have a super admin, whoever the owner is or whoever they want to have, and then I'll be a super admin. And that's kind of where the management goes. And I lock it down from there. Can I ask one more question that may be silly? So forgive my technical ignorance here, but are you just like blocking hypothetically Safari or Firefox from launching? There's an endpoint management component that goes along with that. And yes, you would be uh, restricting what browsers are on the device. Uh, and forcing, you can use context-aware access to uh, restrict where people are logging in from. So that's that's kind of where you have to funnel them into. So, um, but I'm less I'm less concerned about them using a different browser on a as long as it's on a, a device that has endpoint management on it, which would include um, a lot of the things we've most people are familiar with. You know, uh, threat locker, DNS filtering. Um, some type of EDR, MDR, antivirus. I like to use Huntress. Uh, even on Macs, I roll all that stuff out. So um, I, I restrict it to a known secure or reasonably known secure endpoint. Uh, and I think that solves a lot of it. The rest of it is like making sure that you're managing the actual profiles and that's what the requiring sign-in does and then try to funnel them through Chrome. Um, that's that's the best case that I've found right now in terms of the Google stuff. Got it. Um, pre oh gosh, I'm drawing a blank. I see pre-J, but I forget it. Your name. <laughs> I knew you're gonna write a boom. Sorry. Um, with DNS filtering. Luke, it's Luke, right? Pre is Luke. Is that you, pre-J? All right, let's go. Yeah, um, I guess you don't have uh, voice access. Um, we go the other way in terms of Eric V. Do you mind giving us your perspective there on what you're saying? Sure. Yeah. It it's just uh, it's hard to manage browsers definitely because so many people have have their preferences. So we. We kind of have taken the opposite approach internally and said, you know, for for specific company, you know, systems like say uh, accessing our RMM or or some other applications that we're going to make sure that you're using using one browser so that it's easier to support, and then we can then control that browser as well. Because if somebody has Firefox on their machine, that's fine if they want to use that for personal stuff. But we, it, it's really hard to manage because there's so many different browsers out there. And so we have to restrict it somehow to, you know, kind of pick our battles of, of which browser we're going to manage and then what that's going to have access to. Got it. Andy, do you have your hand? I did, and I wanted to ask, um, this browser issue and extensions apply to a lot of uh, EHRs in the world uh, that uh, work through Google. And I think Unify and SAS Alerts in combination with an MDM 
could actually be very valuable if you were able to leverage that more, uh, more in a more comprehensive manner. I just wanted to post that up there. Uh, you mean like, so instead of looking at the RMM specifically, any like, let's just take Sentinel-1, for example, if we're able to bring Sentinel-1 information and correlate it with SAS alerts, is that what you're saying? So the premise being, hey, look, um, your your uh, Chrome extension is, there's a, you know, that I can feed information to SAS alerts and SAS alerts could feed information back to the MDM, uh, to my uh, Unify. Uh, uh, to my mobile device management, whatever tool it may be. Um, and I could tell them, hey, we need to uh, break this. Um, we need to modify the extension or this extension's known bad because you guys are going to begin to have a lot more information feeding in because of Fortify that I think could be easily translated back through Unify to our remote monitoring and management solutions. Interesting notion. So that Andy, that let me translate that for a second. That sounds like you're suggesting that we begin to manipulate settings in the RMM and have that flow back. I'm recommending that you send alerts or um, uh, recommendations back to the RMM, where then we can receive and process those. Does that make sense? Because what you're doing is getting beginning to get real time feedback on cloud environments that our customers are accessing. And that might be a very valuable piece. So Andy, like, hey, this setting in your Chrome browser is set to, I don't know, you're saving passwords as an example. I'm just picking something out of the air. You're, you're saving passwords in your browser, notify us on that. Or if I was to take the idea of Fortify, that would be great, but I don't know that SAS alerts can do that with a browser on a device or on a mobile unit. But what would be helpful is if I was able to send some telemetry back um, through Fortify and have it say, hey, these are some problems that we're seeing, right? And then you'd say, these are actions that should be done through Unify. That kind of uh, communication, because I'm not, I'm not aware of any RMM that will help me better manage Chrome or help me better manage Firefox. And you guys have the ability to uh, look at things and, uh, and get real-time feedback that might be helpful. So think about that. Yeah, there's a, there's a few bridges that have to be built to products there. I mean, we're not, uh, for instance, I'm most familiar with Chrome. Our team is most familiar with Chrome because we also are Google Workspace users in terms of our business communications. And as Chad had pointed out, Google provides a, a lot of muscle to allow administrative to control policies on 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 the browser specifically. Um, we don't read that information back from Google APIs and access how the administrators have set up that data. We, we probably could and do something very similar to what we're doing for Fortify with Microsoft for Google. Um, but when you start extending that into other like Firefox and Safari and other elements, you know, the ability to read that information only happens when someone is signed in to the browser. And oftentimes people don't sign into a browser. I mean, you know, you know so so, limit this to Google for the moment, because I think yeah. that there's a real power power play there. Yeah, but people also sign into browsers with the Microsoft accounts, so that so so there may be some information that's available there that we can explore. But I understand what you're saying, but there's definitely some bridges that would have to be built to make that happen. Okay, mm. thanks for hearing me. Really interesting, really interesting. So so just I guess in closing, different perspectives, but. I guess maybe a yes or no. Do you feel browsers or something? If you could just put a Y or N, browsers something MSPs are going to have to get in the business of managing for good security. Okay. Okay. I don't see any no's. No, I don't either. So the yes have it. <laughs> well, Really, uh, really cool topic today. Really cool hearing all the ex uh, um, success already people are thinking about with Fortify, Jim. Um, and um, I'm excited for you guys and, and all the partners. I think it's going to be huge. Great. 
Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And I know we're uh, we're at the top of the hour, so we're going to drop off. But um, thanks to all and uh, look forward to everyone getting Fortify next week. So we'll look forward to actually some initial feedback from everybody on next Thursday. Awesome. Look forward to seeing everyone. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye, guys.